I love nothing more than to go to my camp alone with a guitar and just let those lyrics and melodies happen. He had the fly rod in the hand, and the hair was up in a red bandana. It was a red and gold plaid shirt and a pair of jeans and shoes and boots. And I saw that fly rod and looked at her, and I went crazy. And at 6.15 in the morning, a guy knocked on my window while I was sleeping. He goes, well, full plane's leaving at 15. So, okay, I'll, I'll get right out. I roll up the window, and the guy traveling with me, I looked at him, I said, I... I think that was John fucking Girok. He said, uh, we started selling it in Tokyo, the main IFNW logo merchandise. That'll tell you. I mean, that was being worn in discos, not duck blinds. Welcome to Flyline Podcast, where we enjoy the interesting stories behind the legendary guides and luminaries connected to Maine fishing. I'm Michael Jones. Today, we'll be talking with our special guest, John Wood. John Wood grew up in Wayne, Maine, fishing and hunting the local area as a young adult. John became a master Maine guide in his mid-adult life, following a deep dive into the sport of whitewater kayaking. John has worked as an upland hunting guide, as an independent guide, as well as working with some of the first-named sporting camps in Maine, Weatherby's, Lakewood Camps, as well as King and Bartlett Camps. John trains his own dogs for hunting and, like myself, loves his dogs more than most people. John is a master of all aspects of archery shooting and has worked as a product representative in the hunting industry for many years. John is a master whitewater expert and has paddled all major rivers and creeks in Maine, as well as ascending the entire length of the Grand Canyon in a squirt boat. What is a squirt boat, you ask? Stand by and we will explain. Guiding fly fishing trips and drift boats was a natural transition and inevitable conclusion as John saw all of the advantages that these craft offer for guiding on main rivers. John and I worked gunnel to gunnel for many years, both out of Aardvark Outfitters as well as at the Main Guide Fly Shop in Greenville. John is a household name in the Maine drift boat community, and everyone that fishes the east outlet of the Kennebec has most likely encountered John. In this interesting conversation, John and I will share stories and themes about becoming a full-time professional guide, his interests in constantly challenging himself to be better at his craft, and also John's contributions as an innovator to the sport by developing two iconic guiding inventions that are commonly used in the industry today. It comes with great anticipation and deserving respect to have John Wood join the Flyline Podcast as this episode's featured guest. John, welcome to the Flyline Podcast. Thank you, Michael. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, I knew when we went on our last fishing trip and I asked you to do the podcast, you were reluctant. And I I was. And because I, what I remember in the beginning, and maybe it was all that I saw, were luminaries and legendary main guides. And and I feel like you've kind of expanded that a little bit. And And what I really got thinking about is I've enjoyed what you've done with this very, very much. And I think you've done just really, truly an amazing job. Thank you. I'm like, wait a second. When I'm being a carpenter or when I'm being a guide, I want someone to listen to me. And so here I am considering you a real expert about this. I needed to listen to you. If you ask me to be on, then. Yeah, you're qualified, John. And the reason you're qualified is I just want to say you and I come from a very similar background in that we don't come from money. Right. Uh, we've had to work every day of our lives. And I think that that's what it takes to be a really good guide. You have to earn it. You know, if you don't go to work, you don't get paid as a main guide. Isn't that right? <laughs> that's true. Yeah. True. And we also grew up, and we're sitting here in a secret lair at Kennebec County. John and I both grew up. I grew up in Mount Vernon. John grew up in Wayne. And uh, I want to know more about that. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, both went to Miranda Cook High School. I was say, we went to the same school. Yep. We went, we're, we're years apart. I'm 54. You are? 63. So yeah. I was the second graduating class of Miranda Cook. That's great. So Miranda Cook, basically, for the the audience, is Wayne, Mount Vernon, Reedfield, and Manchester. Correct. Uh, but back then, John, um, it, if you lived in Wayne, you had a choice of Winthrop. Or Kent's Hill, or did you? Well, so my I went to Winthrop for two years, and then I went to Moranica for two, and then I was I was really really happy to go to Moranica. Okay. Um, I. What do you remember about Moranica when I first started? Oh, uh, that's that's a great. I'm glad you asked that because I think that it might have even changed by the time you were there. Um, so when I went there, it was 
very young teachers, very, very forward thinking, open classrooms. Right. There were almost no walls. And the amount of freedom that you had was just unbelievable. It was like, I mean, it was like being in college. It, you, they just treated you like an adult. I, I loved that experience. I truly did. Yeah. And when, when we were kids, and I can speak for you as well, John, uh, elementary school was very institutional. You were in a closed door. You were sitting military style facing a chalkboard. Uh, they used to hit you back then. I remember if you misbehaved. I mean, really? <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> I mean, good and indifferent. There were no uh, food allergies and there were no um, oh. learning disabilities or very few because you were scared. Right, you were respectful. You were respect, very respectful for a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I could tell. We this isn't about that, but um, what else do you remember about growing up in Wayne? Because I mean, we lived in a kind of a pastoral environment. That Refield Mount Vernon area, the Lakes region, of Bel- Belgrades is just gorgeous. What I what I've often <clears throat> told people, and I'm dating myself with this because I actually, I actually didn't really watch the program, but I was familiar with it. Is it was like growing up in Mayberry. It was just. It was like a utopia. Everybody knew everything. That's right. And if you were to do something wrong, um, by the time you got home, your parents knew. Whether whether it was in school, no matter what. And I think that was a good thing. And and you were safe. You know, there was no you were safe. We didn't lock the doors on our house. Right. I mean, the keys to a vehicle were always inside the vehicle, and it was never locked. Mm-hmm. You know, you, as a kid, I would walk from my house to my best friend's house, which was, I don't know, under a mile, carrying my rifle at the road. You know, yeah, so, very, very young, and nobody, yeah. there, was not, there wasn't a cause for concern. No. You, you know, I would ride my bicycle. I rode my bicycle to, to Wayne Elementary. That was, I don't know, maybe two miles. And then I would also ride over to my So I'm familiar with Wayne, John. Where did you live? I lived on Barry Road. Okay. Um, so Stevenson's had, I think that, that the fields that, that I own, where I'm going to build a house, um, I think that that may have been Ford Stevenson's first strawberry field. Got it. Yeah. Really right in the center of Wayne. I mean, not in the center of downtown Wayne, but right kind of in the middle of Wayne, between North Wayne and Wayne. Yeah. Got it. Kind of not Lovejoy Pond in your well, background. You, you may remember where the desert of Maine, the sand. Sure. Yep. Down at the bottom of the hill, there was an old farmhouse there with a barn across the street. Totally. Yep. Yeah. That's wonderful. So we talked about high school a little bit. Once you got out of high school, John, you're in Kennebec County. What, what was the first experiences? I just want to kind of paint that the palette of what you were doing between your guiding, beginning your guiding career and when you first got out of high school. Because you did some unique things. <laughs> well, I I decided that so a lot of my friends went into the military. And you know, the one thing that I would do different today, like I'd read books about the fighting Green Berets and things like that. But when I was in high school and we were sitting down with guidance counselors and of course, right, there'd be a military recruiter or from all the different branches would come in and talk to. Back then it was really primarily the males that they were talking to, but regardless. And today, everybody knows about whether it's SEAL team or the Rangers or the on and on and on. Had I known more about it, I would have gone to the military. I think you'd have been great at it, John. Well, thanks. I, but I, of course, most of my friends did go in the military. Yeah. And, but I weighed a lot as, you know, then. Um, you weighed a lot? I did. Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. I mean, even though I wasn't really blubbery, I would have had to go in. And back then, they just, <laughs> it was a little less PC. Yeah. Fat boy program. They said, it's good. And the recruiter was honest. He goes, this is going to be a problem for you though, your entire time inside. Yeah. Um, and so I said, no, oh, I'm not looking for that. That's interesting. I didn't know that about you. Not just the weight part, but the, the fact that you, you kind of in hindsight looking in the rear view mirror, which you could join the military, but you know, as you say it, and I know you, and I've known you for a long time. I mean, you have all of the characteristics of what would have been a successful, a special forces soldier. And I have friends who were in the special forces. Right. And, and, you know, the way that works is there's no guarantees, but you know, I had been a track captain. I had been a football captain. I had been. And so I went, I went, all right. Uh, um, I, I would have, I, had I known, I would have said, I'll, I'll, uh, I, I used the term with you a very, very long time ago. I would have thrown my hat in that ring. Oh, I like the fact that you just said that because I was going <laughs> to use that again later. Um, but you also, uh, just for the 
for people not who don't know John Wood, but everyone who does know John Wood knows one one word that describes you is disciplined. And if you're going to be in the special forces, you have to be extremely disciplined. You have to uh, be organized. You have to be uh, sober. You have to be energetic. You have to have more patience than the enemy. And that goes right into guiding too, John. And for the and I feel that being able to work independently, not yes. not without constant supervision. I'm not sh- sure how to best articulate that autonomously. But, yeah, that would have been that would have been a yeah yeah well, yeah. You uh, I think that 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 does a lot. Uh, so we again, you said you would have gone into the uh, military, but you didn't. I didn't. So what I did, I. Um, I I went to Southern Maine Vocational Technical School. Now today they're called technical colleges. Mm-hmm. Um, for call for a two year culinary arts. Didn't but, know that either. Yeah. yeah. So in thinking about getting into the food industry, and I did a little bit, but I, Michael, I didn't want to be inside. I had worked outside. You know, I mean, when when we were young, you could work at one of the boys' camps, or well, yeah. Sure. Camps. sure, sure, sure. the camps. Yeah, I so did, I sure. worked at Andrew Scoggin. I worked at Cobbesee. Yeah. yeah. And um, you could work for farmers, which I also did. Absolutely. But one year, I was able to get on a crew that was building a pretty complicated garage attached to a house. And I loved it. I know. I really loved it. I know. It's fun, isn't it? It is. And, and you know, when we were young, we didn't have new vehicles we had old vehicles now of course vehicles were more simple then but what i became very aware of very quickly were was aptitude or lack thereof Mm -hmm. um and so for my friends you know i mean i could turn a wrench and do very very simple things but on more complicated things it made sense to them but it didn't make sense to me but everything about building load bearing everything made complete sense from the very beginning instantly and i realized right then i'm like it's just a different aptitude. Yeah. I'm going to bring you back, John, to the 80s. Um, Daggett's Market in downtown Manchester. Mm-hmm. I worked there. Oh. The building got taken by eminent domain. You might remember the old Daggett's and the new Daggett's. Yeah. Because they wanted to widen the high, the, the road there. Yeah. 201, 202, 202, I think, right? 202, I believe. 202. And it got taken by eminent domain, and I used to make pizzas and Italian sandwiches and, and sell people lobsters. It's a high school job. Yeah. Well, when the building got taken by eminent domain and destroyed, we had to build a new building right behind it. And I'm 16, 17, whatever, I think. And so I'm now working with a carpenter, studying a wall and creating an open, a rough opening for a window and a door for the very first time in my life. To my surprise, how easy it is and how fascinating it is. Yeah. I haven't done the kind of building you've done. Uh, and let's go back to you because I think you do have the mind for that. And how does someone design a staircase? <laughs> or how do you lay out a kitchen knowing that when you finish all the cabinet work, it's going to fit in and be tight? That's just fascinating to me. Well, I mean, staircases are, you know, there's a lot of math, but the space always, it doesn't completely dictate what you do. Yeah. The, the, best skill that you can have with a kitchen or really a lot of remodels or even designing something new is like if you especially a remodel we walk in and we look at a kitchen but try not to see it try to pretend nothing is there oh i like that yeah and that's and that is how that's how you you come up with a brilliant design and you really you just think about it and think about it and think about it so makes sense if you have time to make a decision take time and make a decision you know i have friends you know that were in the military and some of them got used to making decisions very very quickly and i can make it you know as whitewater people oh yeah we can make decisions very quickly yes but if you don't have to take your time yes and so were you fly fishing at all in in this time period that we're talking about not well (laughs) but you have you had some in, in like you had been introduced to it somehow by yes I actually started completely on my own. My I was from a family of spin fishermen. Sure. Um, and you, I don't know if you were in the Scouts or not, but there was a magazine called Boys Life for of course. Scouts. Yeah. And then back then, my grandfather liked trap. Um, there was fur fishing game. There was field and stream. There was sports, sports of fields. So I, it, 
my first fly rod was a Shakespeare Wonder Rod, spun fiberglass, which I still have. And I purchased it at Value House, which later became Service Merchandise. Yes. And at a Fluger Metalist Reel. And I had three magazines open on the lawn. And I'm trying to yeah. trying to figure it out. And then my uncle was the sporting goods manager for Sears in Lewiston. And so he he was he was a very big sports fan, but especially baseball. And he got to meet Ted Williams several times. And so because of that, because of his access to gear, he and my grandfather sort of went through different phases. I mean, they were always deer hunters. They were always bird hunters. Yeah. But there was a duck hunting phase. Okay. And there was a fly fishing phase. That's really cool. And that was my introduction to the East Outlet. But um, so, you know, my first fish on a fly rod was there was a worm on the other end. Yeah. Because <laughs> I knew I could. Yeah. But then I graduated to little poppers mm -hmm. and anything that somebody would give me or I could find or whatever. Sure. At Picasso. Yeah. And what's very interesting. John said Picasso Lake. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In Wayne. Yep. So you're, I think you were her first class. Um, and. Sinclair okay. and Sinclair advisor. Yeah. So I owned a piece of property across the street, essentially from their house, which is where my great grandfather was born. And so anyway, down, I would ride my bike down to that little, that little lot and wait around, you know, just walk the shore sure. in the water fishing. Yeah. And then eventually we got a canoe, in which case, boom. The entire lake was was you know open to me. Well, you'll you'll listen to the podcast we recorded, Tom Ackerman and I with myself. I did the same thing. It was just a different body of water in Kennebec County. Pickerel, anything you could catch, right? Yep. And we didn't have uh, video games. Well, I mean, mostly it was sunfish, yellow perch, the occasional bass, right? Um, which was a trophy, big deal, or 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 pickle, especially there was a little area we called Pickle Pond. Sure, that's where um, across from across from the McKees. Yes, yeah, right. I, I've, I've actually yeah. fished Pickle Pond. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that 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 was my my beginnings of the fly rod. Yeah, yeah, a lot of fun too. Oh, so much more fun! It plants the seed, and then some time passes, and I feel like the time frame for you, John, would have been about the first time we met. Um, I don't know if it was the first time we met. We might have met in Red Oak Sports, but I know for certain we met at the UMF swimming pool doing roll fly, doing uh, kayak roll lessons. I was teaching there, and you brought you came with Rocco and Peggy Dwyer, Rocco P Pisa. Yes, was, yeah, yep. And there was a good community of people that were wanting to learn how to roll, and you came and you were squirt. You were a decorated kayaker. Let's. Tell, explain to the audience what you were doing with kayaking because it's so relative and it relates to becoming a great guy. So what were you doing with kayaking? So I I didn't spend very much time in the in in the field as with my culinary degree. One thing I found out right away is that it, it was very transferable to supermarkets. And, you know, in the it was really in the early eighties, late seventies maybe, but early eighties that I was working, I, I worked right, right here in, in Augusta, um, for Shaw supermarkets. And with a two year degree, there was no way you could make in, I mean, other than maybe a paper mill, there was no way you could make that kind of money. If you, if you were full time, if you were in management, mm -hmm. which I worked my way into pretty quickly, but I wanted to be outside. So, so I, I went and I went, there was a boom going on down in Portland. I went down and went to work for Wright and Ryan was the company that I worked for. Right. Which is a large construction company. Yep. But of course, you know, you're young, you're, you're chasing the dollar. So I had done, I was always doing little side jobs and I did a side job for a woman who had a kayak for sale. And no kidding. Yeah. It was an old town kayak and whitewater or touring. Uh, sort of a hybrid. Yeah, hybrid, yeah. I mean, it looked like a cigar. Yeah, you know, it was white on the bottom and blue on the top. Oh, I had one. I had a green one. I yeah. It was green on the top and white on the bottom. Yeah. Keep going. I'm so, sorry. Yeah. But I mean, it. I remember seeing a, me, watching a movie when I was a kid and James Brolin had, he was running a river that was, that was like going to be closed and they're going to build a dam or something. And they dropped a net off a bridge and he flipped over, slid underneath it and rolled up. And I was like, oh. <gasps> That is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I was thinking about that when I saw 
that kayak. Yeah. And I went, I'll trade you some of this job for that kayak. So. Mine had a aluminum telescopic pole that ran from across the side. In a, in instead of having individual foot pegs, did yours have that for a foot brace? Do you remember? I don't remember what it had for a foot brace, but one thing I remember distinctly, it had white, that cheap white styrofoam. Oh, yeah. Was it center pillar? Sure, sure. And there was a very, very crude fiberglass yeah, that's it. shape. That's what we which was broken. And so it would always, so as soon as a wave hit the top, it would fall over and you'd feel the thing, yeah. your legs and. Yeah. Um, Kayak has to have a center support so it doesn't. Yeah. And it would cut you and it was, but um, I didn't have it very long. And then I, so you, I don't know if you'll even remember this boat. You may very well, back when I started and maybe yourself to a degree, Performance boats were fiberglass oh, yeah. th- th- at the time. Absolutely. Um, but Perception, you know, was the big company at the time. And they came up with a sort of a detuned racing boat called the Reflex. Totally. And my first, so I, I didn't have that uh, old town very long at all because I was bitten. I, mm-hmm. You know, I was bitten hard. So I bought a Reflex. Now, my cousin, um, I don't know, five or six years younger than myself we you know we were spending a lot of time together on weekends and whether or mountain biking or you know then it became kayaking um <clears throat> but we were athletic and mm-hmm. so we said well we're gonna have to learn how to roll so we learned how to roll but we did not pat the first <laughs> remember either one of us ever did was the gorge oh wow look john's talking about the canterback gorge yeah 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 so the reflex was actually uh, uh came on later i started with the the dancer Yep. Which was yep. years before that. And then yep. there was the Sabre, yes. which is yep. about very similar to the Reflex. But the, the Sabre and the Reflex were basically a slightly tuned down version of a slalom kayak. Right. right? So it had a little bit more bow volume, a little bit uh, lower stern. But that's what was leading us to down to the next conversation we're going to have, squirt boating. Yeah. So Tell me about that rabbit hole. So the, you know, the, the Reflex taught you currents because it was very, very unforgiving, you know, big flat deck and yet a lot of volume. Yep. So that, bought, that thing, I mean, I tried, you know, there were a couple of squirt boats around and I tried to squirt it, but it, you know, I mean, it wouldn't, it wasn't designed for that. There was just too much volume, but it taught me how to, how to deal with current. And, taught, s- and surf probably. And meet a river. Yeah. It was a good surf boat, but the main thing is it was vicious on eddy lines to a very unexperienced paddler. Right. So it, it, it made me good quickly. You so know. what John's saying is if you have a, a kind of a rounded object, that's more forgiving. If you have something that's shaped more like a shoe box and you've got that hard shine angle to the bottom of the boat or the side, and you go into a place where currents are changing in directions and speed, it, it'll flip you right over, right? Oh, dynamically, quickly. I mean, I used to go over sometimes so hard. If I went over on the right, I wondered if any water squirted out my left ear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's hilarious, John. Uh, okay, squirt boating. So um, I really want to talk about that because you and I can talk about that. Yeah. So then, I mean, you know, I remember when they came out and I, I had get fallen into a really good group of paddlers that was... Doug, all, Doug and Diane Oliver, who owned the ski rack, and Dave Gates, who was a paddle maker, and just just a just a really um, great great group of folks. The Bangor and, people, yep. Team. And yep. and so they, you know, they started buying square boats, and so we all we all did. Um, and uh, what's a square boat, John? So it's a very low volume kayak, and you, in a normal kayak, you have, as you mentioned, foot braces where you kind of sit with your toes pointing up in the air, and you've got a pad, simply a paddle on the side that yeah. your foot foot is up against. And where in a squirt boat, you sit sort of like a ballerina; your toes are pointed, and um, so you end up with extremely flexible ankles, and you also end up with misshapen feet because the pressure of uh, you know your bones pushing on the deck, but. Um, Anyway, but they were. I would liken it to if you were looking at someone sitting up in bed and they had just a sheet over their knees and their ankles. Yeah. That's what some of the real super low volume boats look like. That's a good way to put it. And I always kept mine in a bag. And back at the time, windsurfers were very popular. And everybody thought I had a windsurfer on top of the truck because it was in a bag. You know, it's funny you say that. I'm going to, I'm going to 
admit something to you. I was working in the industry, meaning the rafting industry at that time. And we referred to the guys in Bangor as the Bangor Bag Boys, because you guys all had the boats in bags when you show up at the Penobscot to, to squirt boat. Yeah. And that was, so why did you have a bag? Well, it was to protect it. Um, they were fiberglass. They were beautiful and they cost a lot of money. It caught, that, that's <laughs> exactly right. But if you're a dirtbag uh, river guide like I was, you couldn't afford a bag. <laughs> I didn't even know where to buy one. That's, I, that's, so we called you the bank or bag boys. I felt like you couldn't, couldn't not afford a bag for what the thing cost. So did you know John Frischella and Paul Nicolazzo? Yeah. In fact, uh, yeah. I mean, I have a Paul Nicolazzo story. Um, so my cousin and I, you know, we... We kind of bounced around and back, you know, we used to go to the Bangor Dam, you know, before there, yep. or the VZ Dam. VZ Dam, yeah. Right there where the old Salmon Club was. On and, the Penobscot. Yep, exactly. And so Paul, I think he might have been in a vampire at the time, a glass boat. Yeah. He was a very, very good paddler. And, but one thing, Paul had a famously super narrow grip. I mean, he was a real rugged guy and you have to be to have a crazy narrow grip. But so we... John's John's hands are close together. Oh, That's what he's trying to say. Yeah, yeah so, holding the shaft of a kayak. Well, you're, you know, a lot of people have this really, really wide grip. Yes, and so I did eventually because Paul really was. It was like six inches in between your knuckles. Um, but Stacy and I did always stay with a narrower grip. And then by the time you get in the squirt boat, you're always moving the paddle. Yeah, you know, and so it was. A, it was. It was a nice beginning. Yeah, you choke up on one side before you do a squirt or something like that. Exactly. You were always moving the paddle, sort of in a typewriter movement, left and right, back and forth. I agree. Yeah. So um, there's the other connection really with Paul Nicolazzo, and I don't think you know this, but um, John McLeod, who I talk about in many podcasts, as, uh, was the first guy to bring a drift boat down a river in Maine. I'm pr pretty certain he was. He and Paul Nicolazzo partnered up to build their first fiberglass story. You know this? I do. I was there the day the I think it went down the gorge two times. And I was there for one of those days. And it was a double ender, wasn't it? It was. What do you remember? You were there. It, it didn't go well. Oh, did it flip? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 for the audience, uh, uh, an open river dory is ultimately a drift boat on steroids. And you probably should have a self-bailing floor in it. Um, and I don't think theirs did. No, it didn't. It was it was fairly small um, by by you know traditional drift boat standards. It was pretty small. I mean, I'm guessing it was. I would tend to say it was five feet wide at the at the waterline. Yeah. Maybe it was six, but I think it was more like five. Okay, and probably the overall length on the boat was. I don't think it was twelve feet. Okay. Maybe maybe it was twelve feet. They were building it in in Dick Wallingford's garage in Rockwood. They had a they had a mold they were working out of up there. I saw it one summer because I was up there. And in, in another podcast, I talked about learning how to fly cast from John's daughter. But anyhow, we can go down that road. But squirt boating led you into maybe running rivers a lot, and all of a sudden you got an eye on maybe becoming a drift boat guy. I did, yeah. So I mean, I you know I spent a lot of time in a squirt boat, and I ran a lot of things. In a squirt boat, the people were like, well, what are you doing? I know. But it was the only boat I had at the time. Sure. Um, so, but that, as you know, that that really, that's such good training. Yeah. So, yeah, because what what Michael and I know is that squirt boats, one of the things they were famous for is instead of the river being a two-dimensional playground, it became a three-dimensional play, playground because you're tapping into currents that are, you know, maybe four, three or four maybe even five feet below the surface. Mm -hmm. And so that changes or things. Or more. Or more. So that changes things. Yeah. And of course, highly transferable to fishing. Absolutely. Because we could understand the struggle. Like whenever, as an example, one of the things that I noticed um, when I'm in a river and I see the mushroom coming up from the bottom, you're in an eddy, if you will, and you see that water that's, it's like, a, it's like almost like a cauliflower crown. It just doesn't stop doing it. I've learned fish don't live underneath that. Right. It's because they can't. Right. That water's hitting something and it's being forced to the top. So what's the struggle going to be if you're a fish down at the bottom of the river? It's going to be like being on a treadmill that you can't catch up on. Right. And so those are the kinds of things that you learn as a squirt boater that are easily transferable in fly fishing. And I, I always point it out whenever I see it. I say, you see that right there? And they go, yeah. I go, I guarantee there's not a fish there. Right. And there isn't. And I don't talk, I mean, bass, trout, anything. Right. Uh, best example you and I can think of is uh, maybe about 10 feet down um, at the eddy right at the sluiceway on the east outlet. So the upper drop, yeah. the sluiceway, yeah. about 10 feet down, you're going to have fish above that. 
and you're going to have fish below that, but that's that little spot in there where the water comes shooting straight up right. and it's almost void of fish. Um, but again, let's, let's get back to transferring that knowledge into becoming a fishing guide. So you, did you get your guide's license first uh, for, for fly fishing or hunting or tell me about your main guide? Well, back when I tested and, and, they, <laughs> and, he, and I know you know the history of this, and, and but maybe some of the listeners don't. So when I got my first license, and I, I don't, Danny saved his first, and I wish I had, but I didn't. Um, so I believe my first license was, I want to say around 98. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, it, it may be a little earlier, so, somewhere right in there. Sure. Because I, I'm kind of thinking about my first boat I bought used from Artvar. Yeah. From you. Yeah. And, you know, that was, that was a 1999, I believe. And I bought it, you know, a couple of years old. Um, and I, but, but I'd been guiding a little bit before I owned a boat. So anyway, it's so, somewhere in there. That uh, boat, that boat was a 2000 that you bought. Okay. Because we, the first clack of craft that we bought was black on the top, white on the bottom. And before that we had hide and hides were terrible at that point. They were disposable. So we went to Clacker Craft, and then you bought the first black and white tunnel hull. Didn't that boat have a tunnel hull? Yes. And it was, it didn't have a black stripe when you got it? Um, maybe, maybe. I can't remember. You painted it green. I did. I think it was the black one. Yeah, it might have been. And then I, but know, what I remember is it had, it had a casting deck in the back. That's what I remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, Real yeah. Hull. That's right. Yeah. In other words, you could stand up on the back of it, yeah. which I thought had a lot of value. Probably not so much on the East Outlet. Correct. But if you were down in other parts of the Kennebec or the end of Scoggin, it allowed the guy in the back to be a foot above the surface of the water he cast. Right. But uh, so, John, you you came to us and said, <laughs> what did you say? I said, I'd like to throw my hat in your ring. Yeah. And we did. Yeah. And you uh, you helped with, you helped us with a dr- couple, first couple of drift boat schools, not just really just to kind of get your feet wet with what it is to roll one. But at that point, you and I were, I mean. If we could paddle the crib works in a squirt boat, we could run the Sandy River in a drift boat. But it, and and you and I knew of each other, even if we didn't know each other very well. But Bob Dean didn't know me at all. That's right. And so I had to build. I I had to sort of let him know. Basically, I'm asking you to throw me the keys to the car. Yeah, because what John's saying is you wanted to guide through our guide shop. Correct. I mean, so the drift boats were really just like. I watched the squirt boats come in and I went, oh, I've got to get into that. And then I watched the drift boats come in and went, oh, I've got to get into that. Well, you were early on too. I mean, there were other drift boat guides. At that point, Danny was doing it. Uh, Ian had built his first drift boat. Yeah. Uh, but outside of that, there was a, a, a aluminum boat up in Bingham. Uh, the Smith brothers ran it. You were doing it. I, I was doing it. Yeah, right. Bob was doing it. Um, and that was a great time. I mean, we were there. The world was wide open to us. We were dragged the drift boats. I mean, where were some of the first places that you remember? One, okay, now, John, you own your own drift boat. I think you had a Toyota truck. I did. Yep, I did. Right. Yep. And then, and then, I mean, you're, of course, you'd love to fill up your calendar with guiding, but it doesn't work like that when you first start. But you definitely start taking your buddies fishing. You do. And, and so, you know, I, mean, I went, I went everywhere and anywhere. I mean, we, with you, and Bob, we did some trips on the Sandy, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and then I went over, I, with friends, went, instantly went over to the Androscoggin over in. Um, you can say it. Bethel, Gilead. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I also. With, uh, like Ed Bringo. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ed, um, was a, Ed was a big time drift boater at that point. Yep. That's correct. Like you and I, he he had to have one. Right. And. I would go, I had been fishing, um, over in Errol, New Hampshire. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. um, you know, we'd fish that out of canoes. And yeah. so that was very, very, at the time it was, it was, there, it was a pretty good rainbow fishery. Easy to do the shuttle. You could shuttle it with a bicycle. I mean, you could hitchhike it. It wasn't, it wasn't a long section and, and it fished well. And so and, I didn't mind the drive. And there's some, there's enough white water in there that keeps the riffraff out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it was perfect. It was perfect for the drift boat. Absolutely perfect. I, I haven't done it in 25 years. I haven't either. No. Uh, I'd love to see it again, but I, Carter Davidson, right. Fishes it and, 
and some of the guys over in New Hampshire that I've got to know, they they still fish over there. But I actually like the the Connecticut River. Oh, yeah. we should do that together sometime. I'd love to. I'd love to show you a section up there that's just yeah. filthy with trout. Nice. Um, and, and we drift that. Yeah. But we use the raft. You could use a drift boat. I have used my drift boat. Mm-hmm. You can use a drift boat, but I like the raft too. Um, John, we are at a great spot to take a break. We've talked sure. about, we've set the the foundation for what the second half of the podcast conversation is going to be, which is all about guiding because you are a master main guide and you you do it full time in the summertime. And there's not many people your age that can say that they've done it <laughs> as much and as long as you have. So I look forward to coming back. Let's take a short break. All right. For this Flyline flashback, we will look into the history and invention of the fiberglass fly rod. The history on this topic is not completely clear, but I did some careful research and what follows is what I found. In 1944, Dr. Arthur Howell, the technical director of the Plascon division of Libby Owens Ford Glass Company, was on a trout fishing trip in northern Michigan when he broke the tip of his bamboo fly rod. Because replacement tips were impossible to obtain during the war, Howell used his knowledge of glass fiber and resin fabrication to attempt a replacement tip made of fiberglass. Although it proved to be satisfactory, he continued to experiment with rods made entirely of fiberglass. Dissatisfied with these results, he revealed his experiments to Henry Shakespeare, the Shakespeare Company's new vice president and general manager. These rods were a length of glass fiber, soaked in resin, hardened, and finally ground to a round, tapered shape. There were no hoop fibers in the original Howell rods. In researching patents, I discovered that in 1946, Arthur Howell submitted a patent with the United States Patent Agency for the fiberglass fishing rod, as well as a few other items that could relate to this groundbreaking technology. The patent reads as follows. This invention relates to the production of high-strength, lightweight shafts or rod-like materials, which in various sizes may be used for fishing rods, ski poles, boat spars, and other similar applications, and which are unusually effective for use as shafts for fishing rods. The principal objective of this invention is to provide a rod-like material having great strength and resilience in proportion to its weight. Another objective is to provide a rod-like material of great strength and resilience, which is not affected by exposure to the weather or to immersion in water. Another objective is to provide a rod-like material whose outer covering is stressed in tension, parallel to the length of the rod. A still further objective is to provide a method of manufacture of high-strength, lightweight, rod-like material. Dr. Howell built his rods around a balsa wood core. Eventually, Howell and Shakespeare developed the process used for making what were to become wonder rods, where fiberglass was spiraled around a metal rod mandrel. Then, additional glass fibers running the length of the mandrel were added and cured into a fly rod. After World War II, fiberglass largely replaced bamboo as the preferred fly rod material because it was cheaper to obtain and easier to work with. Today, fiberglass fly rods are experiencing a resurgence in the fly fishing industry, with almost all major manufacturers offering a glass rod option. Some new companies are also emerging, specializing in fiberglass fly rods almost exclusively. Fiberglass fly rods cast differently than modern graphite tapers. With glass, you need to slow down your casting stroke, and that means you are letting the fly rod work. A fiberglass rod takes the weight of the fly line, bends the rod deeply, and sends the cast out with surprising precision and ease. Because fiberglass fly rods offer a softer action, they also protect light tippet material that only a split cane rod can match. Fiberglass rods offer a great casting tool for the beginner, as you can really feel a forwarded back cast load, allowing you to perfect good timing in your casting. Today, fiberglass fly rods range in price from $30 to over $1,000. You can purchase a mass-produced design for short money, or commission a custom fiberglass rod from a custom rod maker like you might commission a custom cane fly rod. We will see what happens as time passes, but it is refreshing to see the technology that I learned to cast and fish with experience this explosive resurgence. And now, back to the second half of this episode. Well, John, we're back from the break. Uh, We talked a little bit before about you were doing some guiding for with Bob Dion and I, and but also for myself, John, I just wasn't getting enough work 
being working basically dedicated to one fly shop, I started to want to, I wanted to be on the river more. You wanted to be on the river more. And through that process, um, I, I'll tell you how I got started with Dan. Dan Legier we're talking about. Uh, he was going to film a show with uh, Rick Ruoff and um, Jim LePage from Orvis on Orvis Fly Fishing Life. And he needed a camera boat. So I'm not going to be in the show. I'm going to be the guy carrying the help down the river. Right. So I go up there to the East Outlet, and I'd fish the East Outlet, but never with a drift boat. And we went down through the river, and we had already basically got everything we needed about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the first day. And we were supposed to go for two days straight. The fishing was that good. So after that, Danny said to me, would you be interested in taking on some trips? And I said, absolutely. And he started filling my calendar. And then you came right on the heels of that. I mean, I, there wasn't maybe a year after that. You were right on board as well. Right. Well, the, the original. So I had met Danny two different ways. I met him through you. You recommended me to Dan. Or I think I actually I think I think actually did a couple of trips for Dan through Aardvark. You know, Aardvark yeah, yeah, we were. Yeah, provided, yeah. provided me up to him. But also... You know, after I'd been down the East Outlet with you and on my own, I I would be up there with a friend, like you like you said, you're sharpening your knives out there every chance you get. And I remember running into Dan. He had come in from bass fishing one day at the takeout, and we started talking. And so anyway, I then the following year, and I don't remember exactly what year that was, but I had done a few trips, and Dan called me over the winter and said, would you look? Consider just just working directly for me with a fly shop. Yes, I said. Well, you said, of course, absolutely. And yeah, talk about suddenly your, you know, your dance card gets full, very full. Yeah, and it gets full because Dan at that point was doing an incredible job and always did an incredible job. Penny as well. Um, we learned a lot. We'll talk about what we learned later. But what's really being said is you have the Penobscot River. Yeah. You could drift boat on. You have the East Outlet of the Kennebec. You could drift boat on. Um, you could go bass fishing on Indian Pond, which at the time, you know, I talk in other episodes about bass was a four letter word, but you and I grew to love smallmouth bass guiding with fly rods. Yes. Because everyone was happy and everyone was catching trophy fish and we're putting those fish back and we're not hurting them for the large majority. Don't you agree? But correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So, John. Do you remember your first guided trip with with Danny and and Penny and you know be at the shop at quarter of seven and yeah I mean I've got a couple of my well, my first guided trip really was for you know either you or for Ardvar right um, and the the truth is when you look back at almost any person when they look back at their first few days of doing a job. They just cringe. You know, you don't even want to remember it. No. Because, you know, my bag of tricks was pretty small. So was my fly bag. <laughs> yeah, yes. And it was fall fishing. And you know what fall, and it was late October. Yeah. You know, so it can be, it can be tough. Um, and one of my guys was fine. And one of my guys got incredibly intoxicated. Oh, got drunk. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I found out 15 years later, so it was a while ago now, that he is still bad mouthing me today. The drunk. Yeah. 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 That's all right. Yeah. I, I mean, it was actually, it made a really funny story, but that was my first trip. I remember having a guy one day smoking pot. This is before pot was legal. He was in the back of the boat and he was so stoned that when we get to another hole, he just let the guy he was fishing with, you know, nymph or streamer or whatever we were doing. And the other guy was having a great time. Next thing you know, we go over the final drop and the stoner goes, that's it. <laughs> it's over. And I'm like, yeah, we're done. He's like, no. No, no, because <laughs> he was stoned the whole day. Right? Yeah, I don't, I don't drink or do drugs when I'm fishing. Either get be guided, being guided, or go with friends. Now, my all, all my friends will drink a beer or two, but John, I fall asleep if I do that. I cannot drink during daylight. Yeah, you know, a lot of my clients will have wine at lunchtime or or something, and you know, and I support that. And it, it depends. I mean, the really, I've got one guy that I really enjoy fishing with, and he's a client. And he drinks energy drinks with only just a certain amount of caffeine because he doesn't want to get too jacked up. But he certainly would never touch a drop of alcohol. Good for him. Because, you know, that could mean one fish that he would miss. And he doesn't care when he hooks a fish. Nobody lands a fish any faster because, you know, he wants to be really, really good at the fish. It's, it's just that 
He competes with himself He's, each and every time. Sounds like an intense dude. He's a great guy. Let's get let's get back to Penny and Danny because I want to pay them a bit of homage. Uh, I think I learned as much from Penny as I did from Danny about running a guide business, about being very disciplined. And you know about discipline because we talked about that before. What do you remember about Penny and the organization? Because that was there's a story there itself. There is. I mean, so my version of it, Michael, is you know, Danny had a premier fly shop. Yeah. And and it was in a time when there really weren't that many boats out there. And so there was a just a tremendous amount of growth. I mean, we saw the same thing happen in the whitewater industry. It it yeah. was we were there at the right time. There was a tremendous amount of growth. And Dan and Penny had a business philosophy. And in my opinion, it was not about the money. It was about service. It was about customer service. Dan never wanted to say to somebody, I can't get you a guide. He never wanted to have to say those words. So when quality people became available, clients and guides find each other. Guides and fly shops find each other. That's the reality. And so we found Main Guide Fly Shop. Main Guide Fly Shop found us. I think Chad benefited from that at the Absolutely. same time. Chad, As, Chad came in in a year or two after you and I got started with yeah, Annie. You and Ian were yeah. the very first in. Sure. I was, Chad and I came in very, very close to the same. Well, you were before time. Chad. I remember that. A little bit. Yeah. But one of the big differences, Michael, is my whitewater background. Yes. Just, I walked in fully functional. Yes. Like to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, you could read the river. Yeah. You could see where fish probably would be. And you knew where you could anchor and you knew where you couldn't. And and the bottom line is, and you know that this is a factor, is could operate the boat anywhere safely. You know, the other thing, I think of it a lot, but I notice when I'm with a really good guide, and you guide me now, John, when we go down to East Ola in the fall as a tradition, um, I, I think that you can see danger about a minute before it starts to rear its head. If you know white water, you're looking, you're always looking at least 10 seconds ahead, right? And that white water background with kayaking gave us a unique skill set for guiding a drift boat that uh, I'm going to have you sit down right now. <laughs> sit down. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because you know you're about to hit something or you're going to take a wave over the bow or you, you, you feel you finish a sentence, Chuck. Well, I mean, here, here's, here's something I, that I know that you, well, I suspect. I want your opinion. So when I went from a kayak to a drift boat, there are two things that were a big transfer for me. One is risk. I always thought I'm very, very, very risk tolerant, mm -hmm. except that, that you were just by yourself. Now you've got two people sitting in the boat yeah. that have no idea that there's any risk at all. That's right. And so in the beginning on the, um, what we call the sluiceway on the East Outlet, which is a class three rapid, which Dan Legere's saying, which I think is very accurate, it's a class three rapid with class four consequences. Yes. And so, you know, you're taking people into potentially harm's way. And, you know, Michael and I very much have the skill set to do it. But for me, I'm aware that it's completely different when it's not just you. And so that, that was something I had to work through and I did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's interesting about the sluice way, it's safer when there's high water. Oh, absolutely. It's treacherous when there's low water absolutely it's the rocks that correct. give you the problems correct. and just for the record someone died there two years ago that's correct trying to navigate a boat down through the upper upper section it is not for the faint of heart and it is certainly not for anyone that doesn't have a skill set it's not a place to learn how to row period no. um and then the other change for me michael out of a kayak was i like in a kayak to not just maybe a motorcycle but like a sport bike. Yeah, yeah. And I liken a drift boat to essentially a school bus. <laughs> exactly. And so you learned to how much earlier you had to make your moves. That was a big adjustment for me. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then my, my philosophy that I adopted quite quickly, and I did the same thing with kayaks, is make your move early. You can always back off. So go ahead and just, just get in the habit of do it earlier than you think, because you can always back off later. And and that served me very well at both of those things. You taught me, John, to go through the final drop of the East Outlet. Um, there's, there's kind of a typewriter move there, which is to say the river isn't just moving down. It's also moving from right to left. 
And I noticed one time following you that you set up a little more right than I had. And that puts the boat right into the tongue. You know how it drifts you four feet to the left at the last second? Yeah. You, you showed me that move. Before then, I would actually push to overcome that diagonal yep. direction. Yep. But when I saw you do it and you didn't have to push, you just literally set up four feet to the right and it just typewriters you over that pillow and right down into the tongue every time. Yeah. I mean, you have eyes for it, you know. Well, I mean, we all learn from each other. Yeah, that, that that's very well spoken. I mean, you you did for me what I did for a few other people. You were in in, so I went through the sluice way in your drip boat. Then you let me row, and you were in the boat. Yeah, and you know, giving me a little coaching. And that's right. And we do learn from each other. And and what I want to you know throw out here, um, Michael and I both did learn a lot from Dan and Penny, but I. I learned a tremendous amount from you, Michael. Well, oh, thank you. Um, and and so from from what I learned from you, Dan and Penny, Dan taught me a little bit about fishing. They both taught me a little bit about business. Yeah, but I was pretty you know, pretty much ready to go with everything boat wise after between you know my background and spending some time with you. Working. Yeah. And you and I were in each other's rearview mirror for years. Yep. We were. I mean, we did a lot of double trips. A lot of double trips. And we were in on the river at the same time. There was a lot of language that we didn't even need to be spoken. Right. We had signals and, you know, a nod of the head or kind of a lift of the chin to say, take it, which yep. is to say, you want to drop in the nympho, go right ahead. You know, and a lot of that going on. And we had that going on with Chad. We had that going on uh, with other guides on the river, too. Um, I do want to talk about Penny because she was so perfect in some ways. I remember one of the things, because we were guiding people we didn't know. Correct. Right. Now at this point, John, you and I don't guide people we don't know. I mean, if you call me out of the clear blue sky, you probably aren't going to get me to, you know, right. you probably won't hire me. You might if you're lucky. I hope you're listening, Hugo. Um, but Penny would set us up. She'd say, she, and then you, I love it when she'd do this. She'd put, she'd put all of her body weight on one leg and she'd put her hand on the opposite hip and she'd put her finger right out across that cash register. And she'd say, Michael, listen, this guy, look, listen, he's a prick. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do anything extra for him that you wouldn't, do. you know, she would, or she'd say, Michael, you're going to have this couple tomorrow that just got married. They're staying up at the Blair Hill Inn. And they just want to have a good experience. And she doesn't know how, so I want them to go with you because you're a good teacher. So she always gave us, she was able to set the stage because we were in large part taking on people that we didn't know. Right. And what one thing that she was very good at is is having a sense of, well, this person would be better with with Michael or this person would be yes. better with Ian yeah. or this person would be better with John. And God forbid, if Danny couldn't take one of his regulars, right. they wanted to make sure that they were going to not alienate that guy by putting him with someone that wasn't going to even come close to Danny's standard of quality. And so they put a lot of trust. And actually, that's part of the reason they really, I mean, you, you wore a clean shirt. You were there early. Yeah. Finish the list. Well, I mean that, that you know it was run. It was run like a business. It was run very professionally, and it, it's irritating for me, and probably for for anybody, anybody listening, when someone is in a customer service industry, and they kind of forget that it's a customer service industry. Period. And you say it over and over and over because it's a customer service industry. Yeah, and you even do it with me, John, because I mean you know I know how to tie the knots, and if I screw up my nymph rig or whatever. If I'm going to pay you that day, you won't allow me to take those knots out. You didn't do it this last fall. You're like, Mike, your hands are shaking, you're cold, and it's just going to turn into you cutting that off. Why don't you just hand it to me right now? And you did. It's my job. And the other thing, too, is, you know, we've talked about it, John, is allow yourself to be guided. So let me tell. Yeah. Let me tell. I think that this is, I just love this story. And we have a mutual friend, um, Kendall Bremer. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And Kendall, he uh, does pharmaceutical. Right. And so Kendall fishes with me every year. And, and I, this year, this coming year, um, we're going to try to tie some flies together and we're going to try to maybe fish together recreationally. And, um, but so I got Kendall fishing a different method in the fall of a wet fly and it was new to him. So we're going to, so, so Michael is, for anybody listening, probably at this point realizes Michael is an incredible fisherman. He just he Thank very, you. very talented. Thank you. Um a lot of experience. So yeah, you do. Know, you would do it. You have a tremendous amount of experience. And but when Michael kind of went another in another direction for a lot of how he makes his living, I 
you know, stayed on the river. And so I have a lot of days now and, um, and I have a lot of experience. And so we're, we're on the East outlet and it's fall and I know that there's more fish there that we haven't caught. And I want, I want to, I want to use a different method. And uh, surprisingly, it's, it's a method that Michael had not, wasn't familiar yeah. with. Well, I, I don't familiar, but just don't practice it. Anyway. So I, I said, let's, uh, let's try this. Now I was, I will tell you, I was like, oh God, please, please let this work. And Mike was very gracious and said, sure. And of course he did. He was able to do exactly what I wanted him to yeah, do. Yeah, but I'm cringing the first time. I didn't want to be doing it. I know you didn't. And, and you hooked up either first or second cat. Yes. But so if, if in a place right behind where a guy's standing. You knew there were fish there, and you kept saying, you're just like, Mike, there's fish here. And I'm going, well, how could they be fish here? Because there's a guy standing right there. The reality is, is they want to be there. And the wet fly is probably the only thing that that fish would take. Correct. That's it. That's the key. And, and so the, the important thing is, here is a person with an incredible amount of experience and skill, but he allowed himself to be guided and caught a fish that we, other people had covered that water. And you would cover that water a little bit, or at least close to it, with other methods and not caught that fish. That's right. And you know what's funny now that you mention it? I don't remember. I know we caught a lot of fish that day. I don't remember any of them. I remember that much. <laughs> you created a memory because you taught me something. Right. And uh, that's one of the things that, I mean, if you're, in the, if you're listening to this and you hire guides, don't think that you know more than they do. And I don't care if you're dealing with a 20-year-old or a 23-year-old. Give them all the respect that they deserve. If you have something you can share with them, by all means do it. But don't come out of the gate doing that. The guide, a good guide, will be will be open to learning from you. Yes. And you should do the same. I would say. I would say, the, you know, you, you were very gratuitous in your statement, John, that I'm a very experienced and qualified fly fisherman. That's only because I've been around a lot of people that knew more about one aspect of it than I did. Someone knew how to streamer fish better than I did. Look at what we've learned over the years guiding people. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you sit in a day with Lefty Cray for, you know, two days a summer, every summer for 10 years. You learn a lot about smallmouth bass fishing. Like that. And he wouldn't do the same thing twice. He wouldn't tie that same popper on. He was all about doing something different. But this isn't about Lefty. This is about you, John. Um, so you continued to guide. You bought a home in Sherlock. I did. I did, yes. So you were really going to, you were going to bury your roots in the Greenville area. And you were going to, the East Outlet is that good. It is. And I also, I, I like the area. I like to snowshoe. I like to bird hunt. I like to deer hunt. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like that area. I enjoy the area. So Shirley is just south of Greenville. It's the last town you go through just before you get to the place where you see the lake for the first time coming over Indian Hill. Exactly. So we, we used to live for years down at Chad Cray's camps. Um, Chad owned a couple, Chad's one of our guides for the audience and worked at the main guy fly shop with John and I, and he would allow us to stay at his cabins there. And John, you, you basically just bought the, the next cabin over. I did. Yeah. Just up the street. I mean, even a, even a mediocre golfer could hit a ball from my place to chat. Yeah. It was nothing you could walk down. No right, problem. Right. And we're seven minutes to the fly shop from there. Correct. And you, if you, I don't know, maybe the cell reception's better where it used to be, but we used to have to drive up to the end of the road or stand out in the middle of the pavement to get signal. I have, I, have a, I have a booster at my house. Ah, yeah. Yeah. We, it's better, but it's with a booster, it's just weather and stuff doesn't matter. And when, when I've called you the last couple of times, you've been standing right in your house, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. So you got a, you got a place there. You stay there in the wintertime. I do. And you guide. I know. So what you, the audience doesn't know is that, uh, John, you had a pretty serious injury. Two. Yeah, two. And you had to have surgery. I did. I had, um, I had my right shoulder done in November of 22. November 1, 22, and I had my left shoulder done February 24th of uh, 2023. So if you row drift boats, which weigh a lot, and you have heavy people in them and all the gear, rowing is off the table for a while. I, I was rowing 12 weeks after my second surgery. Yeah, after your second surgery. So three months. Yeah, and you rowed this last year. I did. Yeah, you did great. So you feeling good? I do. I feel very good. Yeah, I um I feel I feel lucky to be alive 
in a time where medically that type of repair is an option, which I consider a miracle. I just consider it a miracle. It is. So, John, there was a period where the main guide fly shop was open, and then Danny basically shut the lights off, but kept the guide service going. Correct. Do I have that correct? Yes, you do. Yeah. And so that was after I had really stopped working, you know, in a large capacity for Dan. Yes. But you continued to. I did, yes. And um, tell me about some of the different trips that you were doing. Like, we talked a little bit about Indian Pond. Uh, obviously, the East Outlet, we can pound the hell out of that. Everyone knows that there's no secrets about what the East Outlet is. It's a great place to go. It is. Where else would you like to guide people? You've got a new place that you smallmouth fish. I do. And, um, you know, I, I we all... We all went over the West Branch some, and I, it, it's a great river. It's a terrible road. If somebody else owned the vehicle and somebody else owned the boat, it would be a different story. Um, but Chad and I, together, the same year, we talked about it, and we said, we're just not going to do the West Branch anymore. We've got all the business we need on the East Outlet. And I, I have been playing around for a long, long time because I'm very fascinated Um with a bang up section. Yeah. Below one. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. And, and, um, a, a, a mutual acquaintance, uh, you know, dear friend of mine, Todd Toll does a lot of work there. A lot of the, a lot of really good guides work there. I should get Todd in the podcast. I would recommend that. Yeah. And would he? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That would be, yeah. I, yes. Let's I, do it. Okay. Um, and then, and so one of the things that Todd will tell his clients at the end of the day is to say, okay, I just saved you however much a Western fishing trip cost. Because it's pretty low the playing field. If you can catch fish consistently in the Bingham section of the of the Kennebec River, you can catch fish out west on any of the complicated rivers. Yeah. So, John, what the difference between the East Outlet and Bingham is, although Bingham is a tailwater, which is to say it lives below a dam, it fishes a lot. Well, it is a tailwater, really. It's, it there's no other way to describe it. No. But the flows really change there a lot. Where the East Outlet is, stays at the consistent flow all day long. If you look at the water release on the Bingham section, it's very similar to the Harris Dam up in the Gorge, where at some time during the morning, it goes from nothing to everything. Typically on in Bingham, it changes two times over the course of the day. My point. And the, and the fish don't care. The, the fish don't. I mean, it takes a massive change to bother the fish at all. And... All, the only time the massive change bothers them is if it's enough to blast the bot so that it clouds the river. Sure. If that doesn't happen. And that rarely happens. It, that is correct. And But the, the insect, it's just, it's fascinating. The water temperature is almost exactly the same as the East Outlet. It's never more than two or three degrees difference. And yet, caddis are two weeks earlier down at Bingham. The water temperature is the same. How can that be? I don't understand. And the the um, the quantity of bugs and the variety of of insects I, I is think, so much greater. I think that has to do with light. You're getting a lot more light penetration to the bottom in Bingham than you're getting on the East Upla. I think you're probably the right. river's wider there. You got a lot very different gravel. Yeah, it's it's almost exclusively gravel versus the East Outlet is ledge and rocks. Right. Correct. I mean, when's the last time you lost an anchor in Bingham? It's true. Never. Um, yeah. Good point. And so it's. It's a. I describe it as a fickle mistress. It can be forgiving. Um, a fickle mistress. Yes, I love that. Yeah. Go on. Um, I mean, it can. You, you know, you might have a day, blistering hot day, and you're there at one o'clock in the afternoon. And you're fishing water that's two to three feet deep, and you'll catch a big, beautiful rainbow. And you and you just think, why did that just happen? And they're native there. They are. Well, they do some stalking, but go ahead. Well, I, you know, I I I may be wrong. Um, so, but. To my knowledge, a rainbow hasn't been stocked there in a very long time. That's correct. So I think that's the yeah. that that's the reality to that. Um, so they are at this point self sustaining, natural, reproducing, and but they're not wild original fish. Correct. Yeah, they're correct. not native originally in Bingham. That is correct. But what's kind of neat, you know, I mean, they've just be there has never been a paper mill above Bingham, but there has been a lot of logging. Right. It's an it was largely an industrial river until right. you know seventy four, but since then. It really is a beautiful, like you said, Todd Toll would describe it. it you could be um, on the Yellowstone. You could be on, I mean, I haven't fished out west maybe as much as you have. No, I've never fished out west. Okay, so there you go. I have fished more out west right. than you have. But yeah, it's like that. So you have hatches. You have 
a uh, lot more mayfly caddis, stonefly going on. There's a lot of good streamer fishing in Bingham. Mm-hmm. Um, I love Bingham. I love Bingham. Yeah. And, you know, if I get a day off, I go to Bingham because I like the challenge. Um, you know, it's a more technical fishery. Um, and I don't want to beat up the the place that I may be working the next day. I know. So I, know. So I go to Bingham. Well, let's let's schedule a day. Um, we'll meet in Bingham and I'll bring my jet boat. Perfect. What do you think? Yeah. We'll go up and down. Yeah. And we'll never have to do a shuttle. There you go. And you'll go, well, let you run it. It'll be fun. It's a blast. Yeah, I'll have I'll have one at some point. <laughs> yeah, they're fun. Yeah, they're not they're not for everyone and they're not for everywhere. I mean, you'd never even if you could, you wouldn't take a jet boat up the East Outlet because you'd alienate your car your tires would be flat at your car when you got back to it. Right. I, I hope that never happens. It won't ever happen. Well, I should say it won't. I had a guy go by me one time in one of those uh What's it? Mokai's. Yeah, a Mokai. Yeah. Remember seeing that guy on the road? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what he found out, you won't see him very much. His going up was easy, but then he had to run the final drop when it was over. Oh. So yeah. probably saw him the one time. He that was him. the one time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I was down in the, I was in the Colorado uh, when that happened. Um, so we did talk, I just asked you about uh, destination fishing, John, going out west. So maybe you haven't been out west, but you have fished in other places. I have. I, I love I love the Bahamian family islands. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely love it. And, you know, bonefish, I always tell people, if, if, if you want to know what it's like to catch a bonefish, if you know a 17-year-old that has a jet ski, just tie your, your line to the end of it and tell them to, hit, you know, take off. Um, because it's just unbelievable. And, and I've got pretty good eyesight. And and I, you know, we're both hunters. Yeah. So it combines all the things that we enjoy. You know, you've got to find the fish with your eyes. Yeah. Uh, so it's hunting and fishing. And then, and then you know, you're going to absolutely, you know, long cast sometimes in wind. I mean, it's just. It's everything. It's everything. It's it absolutely is. everything. And what I like about it is. Um, it, it, it's not it's not doing a lot of casting it's no. doing a lot of walking and observing which is really what i enjoy about the sport as much as anything i mean we when we're fishing on that example you saw that i keep talking about it but let's say we pull into a pool and we're going to nymph it i can't see a fish there right you might but for the most part you don't when you bone fish you don't cast until you see a fish right. you don't that's what's that to me that's yeah you don't blind cast now i i have learned from, you know, I haven't worked with guides very much there, but I have learned that um, if you've got kind of a deep creek where you can't possibly see a fish, you're wise to make a few blind casts in there because chances are there you may catch fish moving through cool. or maybe even holding a little bit. And, you know, the tides aren't as big there. I was fishing years ago in, on Grand Bahama and there was a school of about 200 or 300 bonefish uh, traveling in front of me. And how, where do you cast? Well, I cast to the outside of it, and they someone just picked it up. Right, I've done, I've, and that that is the you know generally the, cons, the, the and I don't have a ton of experience, but that's generally considered to be the the preferred method. But what I what I am well aware of is a single bone is incredibly hard. Two bones is fairly hard. Twelve bones and up is very easy. It's like if you if you have to give a dog a pill, it's really hard if it's just one dog. But if there's three dogs. He'll eat it just because he doesn't want the other two to get it. Oh, I like it. And that's exactly how it is with bonefish. The more of them there are, a big school like that, you can plunk it right in the middle. And even though they might spook a little bit, the bottom line is there's a whole lot of other people that want that thing, and I'm going to get it first. Yeah. I, th- I love that analogy, and it's totally, totally the case. So, John, um, you know, it's tough to make a living as a fishing guide because there's a lot of time that you can't take people out fly fishing. What have you done to to basically make a dollar over the years outside of just guiding? Well, the primary thing is I, you know, I've been a carpenter, cabinet maker, you know, had a modest cabinet shop for a long time. And that, and, and that's, that is what I do now. But I, there was a brief period of time where for people like Michael or myself that have a lot of outdoor experience, a lot of companies would like us to that is pro staff. You know, you go to yeah. you, you know, you go to events and you represent the product. And as a pro staffer, you might be given some product or you certainly get real good discounts, but you're knowledgeable. You're 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 the real deal. You're really talking 
you might be talking to some very, very knowledgeable people and you've got to really know what you're doing and, and, and know the product. That's pretty easy. Well, I was sold by a good salesman. He needed more than a, than a pro staffer. He needed a sales rep. Um, so I, I, I worked for a couple of different companies. I'm thinking more hunting job, right? Um, well, yes, I, no, I did. I didn't do any, any fishing. I, I sold ammunition. I sold Black Hills ammunition. I sold SKB cases. Um, and I worked in the art, archery industry. Um, there were a couple of different bow companies that I worked with over the years. One of them was Strahler. Um, you did some clothing. You did women's clothing. And I did. Yeah, I did. Um, at the time that I represented them, it was She Safari. They worked on, they were working on changing their name to She Outdoors. And I did a lot of work with, as a salesperson at L.L. Bean, and they were a wonderful company to work with. Yeah. Um, and I traveled, I, I traveled all over New England. And you look good in women's honey clothing. <laughs> Thank you. Glad yeah, you know. yeah, you're comfortable with your sexuality. No. Uh, yeah, so it is, John. You did that for a while, but now you've gone back into cabinet making. I have, yeah. So, yeah. so that, you know, the thing about that is it's a lot of travel. It's a lot of time away from home. And where the rubber really meets the road on that is if you if you worked at LLB or Kittery Trading Post or one of the big, big companies for a period of time, you'd be picked up by a big company mm -hmm. where you had an IT person and you had a salary and all. And I, I didn't have any of that. And so it, it, it really just the juice. The, the, the juice was not worth the squeeze. Yeah, but the juice is worth a squeeze with doing your fine carpentry and cabinet. I love it. I, you have your own shop. I do. I, I absolutely love it. You I, helped I to rebuild the Blair Hill Inn or parts of it. I, I did some, I've done some work there um, for the previous owner and um, and for Jen Whitlow, Jennifer Whitlow, who owns it now and has done, you know, tremendous. Everybody that I was ever associated with there, um, Ruth and Dan, as well as, as Jennifer Whitlow, they just did great great stuff and they're they're a lot of fun to work with the blair hill inn is the mansion at the top of the hill overlooking moosehead lake just up the east shore heading toward Cocadra. correct gorgeous i don't know when it was built but it is just exquisite they are the, and it ain't cheap John. no they're they're they are the gold standard in that area as far as luxury Yes. You knew if you were going to drag your drift boat up and pick up a couple of people at the Blair Hill Inn, they were well healed. Yeah, that is true. I did it a few times. It was intimidating. But, you know, let's talk about guiding different types of people. Sure. What's been your experience? What's a good fit for you? Well, you know, I feel that the guides and clients, I think we might have, you might have mentioned that earlier, you, you find each other. So in the beginning, and when Main Guide Fly Shop was really, really growing, and Michael and I were there, you know, during extreme growth. Yes, yeah. the kind of growth that will sometimes hurt a company because it was so fast and so much. Um, so one of the big surprises to me as I started guiding is that you know, Michael mentioned earlier, we we didn't grow up rich. Uh, no. So, it, 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 you know, it seemed like a lot of money to me. And it didn't occur to me that somebody would spend that much money to, to do something that they weren't incredibly experienced about. Over, after a while, that did make sense. They have the opportunity to learn. It's you know, they have an opportunity to cover more water than they could any other way. There's all kinds of reasons why, even though it isn't inexpensive it's actually a good value and the other you know real real simple um linear equation is if mike and i go and we you know we hire somebody that's out of two different households if a husband and wife go that's out of one household and that's a completely different financial equation yeah but i think it's the best money you can spend if you have limited time like i have now uh you know if i if i drag my own drift boat up and i have one right um, I'm going to spend half the time fishing and half the time rowing. I'm probably going to spend more like 75% of the time rowing and 25% of the time fishing. Correct. But if I go with you, I spend 100% of the time fishing. Correct. And I don't have to worry about the shuttle and I don't have to worry about the cooler and the lunch. Right. And I'm going to learn a lot, which I do always, even from you, right? I mean that in the most respectful I, way. No, 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 no. I know. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes we, uh, we have some back and forth about stuff and we learn from each other um, when we're going. But you know, you talked about Ann Sinclair and Dave Sinclair. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a great example. I mean, here there's two professionals, probably retired now. I would guess that Dave and Ann are. But I know Dave's got to be retired from the Maine State Police. Well, from the Maine State Police, but he's he's got a big, big 
business. Diving business, right? And fishing. And fishing. And okay. fishing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Captain. And yep. yeah, I mean, they, they, it's the things he's doing are very, very interesting. So we won't go off on that because we're talking about you, but the type of people that they are is they're, they're professional mainers. They, they're, they're, they have enough money to hire John Wood for the day. And uh, they're going to meet you somewhere. You're going to take them down the river. You're going to arrange the, the, the shuttle. So they really all they have to do is show up. Correct. Yeah. And one of the things I noticed about you, John, I want to talk about innovation is that I see them. I saw one yesterday, the rod rack on top of the car. The No, they're aluminum now. They're probably five, $600 or more. I don't know. I won't buy one. But John had the first rod rack. You built it. Well, I have one. And I mean, the, you know, one of the things. When we're is, talking about a rod rack, this is what's on top of a pickup truck. So you do not have to take the rod down. Correct. Right. You see them now on you, cars everywhere. All, all over the place. But well, you had the first one. Well, I mean, you know, one of the questions is always, you know, who, who had the first idea? And chances are they were, they were all over the United States. But I came up with the idea on my own and I did build one and I, I had one early and everybody said you should patent it. But, and I, I I, not that particular thing. I, there were things in the past that I looked into patents. It, I mean, forget about it. Just forget about it. So what John had was a wooden lockable box. Small. Yeah. And it went into schedule 40 PVC pipe. I think you have four banger. It was a four banger. Yeah. So what, what's being said is, um, innovation comes out of necessity correct and when you're guiding and you get to indian pond and you have four rods that are set up with nymph streamer dry wet you don't have to break them down for the next day if they're set up correctly you can just pick that rod right out and, and get started and that's a real time save it's time and materials nymphs you know you you can't reuse all that leader you can reuse the weights kind of but i mean for me to rig that you're looking at you're looking at five minutes easy yeah. per rod and you're gonna have two of them yep um and then that's you know in the morning every day after day after day i know it was yeah. compounded yeah and so I, I that's not even your greatest invention <laughs> do you know what your greatest invention is john um tell me what your opinion is of my greatest invention. there's no opinion involved it's a fact oh, the, it, an the anchor the anchor yeah. yeah so when if you're if you're someone that's gone on a fly fishing trip and you are, or you just bought a drift boat, it won't take long until you discover there's this new product out there called the Tornado Anchor. And the idea is that it's all these independent flat plates that can rotate around. The reason being is if you have one slug of weight and you drop it down into the east outlet between two boulders, it's gone. You're never going to get it back. So John came up with this idea because we lost anchors. Oh, Those okay. pyramid anchors, you spend big money for them and then you lose them. I used to scuba dive. I'd snorkel go to go after right. them. You remember me getting wet and going after anchors? I do. And yeah. I um, I learned, you know, leave a, leave a little rope out and I had a boat hook. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah. So we, we, we did our best to retrieve them. But, but John came up with this idea. If you took weightlifting weights and you didn't even need to put a washer between them. We just would make an eye bolt threaded through with a nylon lock washer or lock nut, some heavy duty washers, because the washers are going to mushroom after a while. Yep. Yeah. And you drop that down into that same hole because the plates spin, you can fish it back out of there again. And it worked like a charm. And next thing you know, When's the last time you saw a boat on the river that didn't have one? The, uh, as Michael said, this the, this new this new anchor, people tend to have that or they have the stack of weights. The other thing that's really, really good, and I have been meaning to make one and I have used one and I will make one, a chain curtain. It sure. Works really well. But a, but a, but a curtain, not not one not a long, but you know, you've seen them, I know you have. They work really well. Yeah. Because what I think they do, John, is they create surface area. Yeah, they yeah. they basically spread out over the object that they're up against. Where yeah. ours, when I say ours, I mean the plate anchor system, which I will die owning those. Right. I think they work great, and and you came up with that out of necessity, right? Right. Anyhow, John, this is the kind of stuff you and I could go <laughs> on. We could <laughs> we could block, burn every log in the pile talking about <laughs> this stuff, and uh, it means everything that you took the time to join me today. We uh, you drove a long ways. Uh, I think you tell a great story. You've become a friend over the years. I trust you. I trust you with my life because you, you've done it many times for me. We help each other out. We've helped each other out in tough situations on the river. I admire the hell out of you. And I just, 
I think it's such a, a great thing that our audience can get to know John Wood. And by the way, if you want to hire John, <laughs> you probably can't. <laughs> well, I mean, guiding's different for you now, John. Right. We, Chad, um, Danny, myself, our people essentially, like say someone comes on May 19th in 2022 or 2023, that's basically that person's day for the, for the next year. They typically take, they keep that day. If the, chem- I mean, if you, if the chemistry's right. All right. Well, yeah. And, and at this point, at this point, the chemistry's right. It's for a very, very, very long time. That's how it's been. You know, you just look at them and go, okay, the 19th is on a Thursday next year. Do you want? Yep. But yeah. So, so, and you know, we're getting old. I'm 63 years old. We're, we're, we're cutting back. Um, so between having a big clientele and cutting back, don't have very many openings for new people. Yeah, that, that, you've, that's the reality. You, you built a career over this time, John, of showing a lot of people great experiences and offering them great memories. Uh, I think that we've really added something to the main community through guiding you have especially by doing it continuously. And I think for that reason, you are a legend in the luminary. (laughs) Well, thank you, Michael. Yeah. And thanks for joining the podcast. Thank you very much for the invite. I'm honored. That brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you for joining us for this intimate discussion. And thank you for listening to Flyline Podcast. A new Flyline Podcast episode will be released every two weeks on Tuesdays. So be sure to come back to meet our next famous guest. Until then... This is Michael Jones, and we invite you to visit the blog section of our website to enjoy photos and contributions from our guests and experience all of our episodes at flylinepodcast.com.